well now, we're moving on to our last speaker of this year's uh, 2017 Affordable Housing Summit, and it's Joanne Stevens. Uh, who is Joanne Stevens? Joanne Stevens is uh, a, a broker, it's someone that uh, we get more positive feedback than virtually any other broker, uh, seemingly has extremely good people skills, returns calls, returns emails, doesn't lie to people, understands the industry, grew up in the industry. In fact, uh, we were fortunate enough to buy the, uh, the mobile home park that uh, her father developed here a few years ago. And uh, so anyway, we just thank the world over and she has agreed to be on here to answer uh, questions and talk about working with brokers in 2017. Uh, Joanne Stevens, are you here? Yes, hi Frank. Hey, well Joanne, we're glad you're here. Now as you see, we're running a little late and they say that uh, brokers are often fast talkers. So we'll <laughs> test that theory and, uh, and let you get at it here. So uh, with no further ado, here's Joanne Stevens. Oh, thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you, um, Brandon and Dave, for holding this summit. I've learned a ton, um, as usual, and I also want to thank Frank and Dave for just, you know, it's extremely rare. I don't know of any other industry where the people will share their knowledge and their experience and their ideas with other investors. It's I, I've never heard of anybody that does what Frank and Dave do. So they've really um, helped me. They've helped so many people um, understand this business, and it's a great business. So I have a few slides, and um, uh, I thought I'd you know mention a few things, Frank. But please jump in if if um, you know if you, when you um, want to say something. So sure. Um, one thing with you know, working with a broker, you know, it's really I I like to know uh, when I when a buyer calls, just what they've how long they've been looking because you know if somebody went to the boot camp, you know, say eight years ago and they haven't bought a park, that's you know maybe they're just not the kind of maybe the park business isn't for them, but if they have made offers and will share, you know, what happened with the offers. That they made did they were there multiple offers and they just got outbid or just you know what what the story is and if they bought uh, properties brokers really like to know uh, what you bought what was it about the property that appealed to you um, what was the cap rate you know brokers are always looking for comps so even if you didn't buy through the broker you can really um, you know uh, be memorable to the broker if you're willing to share what you're buying and um, you know what what you've done with the property uh, s since you bought it. And um, you know, I just had a phone message today from somebody who they um, I talked to a year ago. They bought a park. They didn't buy it through me, but the message said, uh, "Hey, I bought a park, and I remember when I talked to you, you helped me. Uh, you know, with." I don't even remember what what it I helped him with, but but you know brokers um, all, oftentimes don't get a lot of positive feedback. <laughs> so to, to make yourself memorable, if there's you know if a broker did help you um, figure out a deal, even if you didn't buy um, the property from them, it wouldn't hurt to um, and it might very well help you make a deal with that with a broker if you uh, if they helped you in some way. Um, a lot of times, too, when you're looking at these uh, properties and um, you want to, if they're pre sometimes if they're pre presented by a broker, listed with a broker, or just with a seller, the financials and, you know, usually there's not many pictures and not much information. Sometimes those um, properties can be a real opportunity. You know, I know. Um, mobile home park buyers that um, other investors just passed on the deal because it looked like it wasn't making any money it didn't look like it was a very good property but some um, smart investor really started asking a lot of questions and digging through a lot of gibberish 
and they figured out, well, there is really a, a, a deal here to be made and a good return. So try to, um, you know, if it's a property that's in a market you're interested in or if there's something that fits your criteria, keep digging you know, until you just exhaust it and just um, either make the deal or just say, forget it, there's no way I'm going to make this deal. Okay, so the next slide is, um, you know, be willing to tell us what you've, what you want and, and what you don't want. A lot of investors aren't real clear. You know, they know they want to buy a park, and they've been to the boot camp, and they've, um, you know, which I've been to two boot camps, and I think they're they're fabulous. I would, you know, really encourage you to go um, again if you can work it into your schedule because you'll hear things at the second boot camp that didn't even um, register with you the, the first time or just you know go through and review the, the notebook uh, and sometimes just re-listening to some of the Frank and Dave tapes um, their audio tapes helps you get clarity on what you want and, and what you don't want but try to be able to articulate that both for yourself and uh, for the broker and um, so uh, what I'm seeing today with uh, some of the buyers that I work with they're they're very good they're very uh, able to quickly analyze the park the financials the local market and decide uh, and let the broker know this isn't for me or I, th this is for me. Let's let's make an offer. And you know, if it is, if the property isn't for you, it's brokers really like it. You'll you'll um, make points with brokers if you tell them. And here's what I don't like about it. Here, this this size of a market or this type of a market isn't for me. And here's the reason why. That that is very helpful to um, brokers to get your your input. Um, so the next slide is a little bit about uh, don't don't fear a seven to eight cap uh, deal. I know this morning I, Dave Reynolds was talking about you know cap rates have compressed and they have, and who knows if that's a short term thing or a long term thing. But um, I want to mention something that, to give maybe a little perspective to the investors that are on this call. And several months ago, I was at the George Allen event in uh, September in Nashville. And there was um, a very well-known uh, park owner, park developer. He has a very fabulous portfolio of properties. And last year, he was offered a ginormous price for his portfolio, which he turned down. But he's, um, you know, it's a multi-generation family there, the the parents, the kids, now the grandkids are in the business, and so it just didn't fit their lifestyle to sell the property. But they, but one of the things that this um, um, very good owner said was, "Gosh, these prices that um, are being offered on these parks, or that people are paying for these parks." How can people make any money paying these kind of prices? And another um, park owner who is equally experienced, owns a lot of parks, has been in the business for decades, said, well, that's what they said 30 years ago. And that's that's really true. That And Frank, I think you would probably, you know, I've heard similar things over the years that, gosh, if you pay that kind of money, there's no money there. But um, you have to be able to look at, if you're going to pay a six or even a sub six, which I'm seeing Midwestern parks sell for below six caps. And that's probably okay if you have a plan of what you're going to do to get it up to a nine or a 10 cap in a 12 to, to 24 month period. And, um, you know, one other comment is when I got into commercial real estate, we didn't look at, uh, you know, uh, I have the CCIM designation, which is, you know, through the National Association of Realtors for um, Commercial and Investment Real Estate. We didn't really look so much at a one-year 
uh, hold on the property, which I realize people hold parks for a very long time, but we looked at a five-year to a 10-year hold and then arrived at a at a um, internal rate of return. So, you know, the park business does have a little bit of a different spin on just how they evaluate properties. I mean, um, you know, some of these, um, you know, six and seven and eight cap rates would be a very high internal rate of return. So um, one one idea when you're, you know, thinking that these prices are so high and it's going to be harder to make money, you have to think long term uh, about the parks too and, and look beyond the, the cap rate. I I really liked what Dave Reynolds said today about the revenue department. I'm going to set up a revenue department because that is part of the, the planning. And you have to keep asking yourself as you're looking at a park, or even when you own a park, what can you do to get it to be a, a 10 cap? It's getting more challenging to find uh, a property that's a 10 cap right um, right out of the chute. And if it is, there's probably some other um, challenges too. So I wanted to talk about the um, private utilities, uh, and that's on the, the next slide. I know that there are more risks with the private utilities, and I also know a lot of park owners who have uh, private utilities, and they manage their private utilities extremely well, have no problems. It doesn't even dawn on them that private, you know, to think about private utilities versus city water and city sewer. That's the way it is. They know what they need to do and they do it. And they stay on the good terms with the state DNR officials. Um, and so I'm not necessarily advocating for private utilities, <clears throat> but I am seeing, you know, some properties in some markets that have private utilities and there's a lot of growth going on and cities like to grow and they like to get get these sewer lines and water lines extended so one idea might be to look at what is the growth what is the likelihood is it going to be one year two years five years ten years unknown um, never that the utilities are going to be extended to the property. Um, I did a, um, a real estate review, which is a market analysis for an owner of a really fabulous park. And uh, the guy is getting a little older, thinking about selling. He'll probably sell in the next year or two. But it's four miles away from the nearest uh, city utilities. That's probably not ever going to happen. It's not a, uh, an area, you know, it's an okay area, but it, it's probably not going to have that much growth. Um, I have a property with private utilities, and even though I know that that's not, you know, uh, the, the ideal situation, but uh, the city where I own this park just bought a farm next to my park and they're going to be extending the water and sewer across the highway and annexing the farm into the city and so um, in a reasonable amount of time I will be able to um, get city water and city sewer and it's not going to be uh, cheap to do that but it but then I will have the the city utilities and will it'll mitigate the the risk. So um, let's see. The next thing is the um, surveys and phase ones. I know it's very typical that when a buyer makes an offer to buy a property, they offer to pay for the phase one at at their expense. And uh, you know that's you know the buyer of the sell that's become commonplace. It didn't always used to be that way. It used to be that the seller uh, provided the, the phase one. On the surveys, you might want to think about offering to front the cost of the survey. 
and then split the cost or be reimbursed for the cost of the survey at the closing. And here's why. Sometimes these sellers are very skeptical of buyers and they they don't like fronting a lot of money even though the cost of getting a survey done is minuscule compared to the price that they're going to get paid. But they think in terms of uh, they're used to counting dollars and cents, and so if you, you know, think about if you would be willing to do the the survey. I'm doing a transaction right now where the buyer doesn't. There's a bunch of extra ground that goes with the property, and you probably uh, will know or will know if you um, you know buy a park or look at a lot of parks, make offers on parks that sellers don't like to subdivide their ground even if it's um, you know clearly nobody's um, probably going to build any more sites even if it's zoned for to build more sites and uh, they look at it as a badge of an accomplishment that they have you know got zoning for this extra ground which that is an accomplishment it's very hard to do but they just don't like the hassle of you know subdividing and getting new legal descriptions and going before the city council to get the approval for their um, new um, subdivision or whatever they're parceling off. So you might think about you know sharing that cost and that's what's happening in this this deal that the it's five thousand dollars and that that's important to the seller. Well, I would say um, to get a park that's probably a eight or nine cap from day one to um, if you're going to have you know another twenty five hundred dollars, it's probably well worth it to appease the the seller and make him feel good about it. And also with the um, the phase ones, and you know if you are going to pay for them and and or front some of these costs, make sure that you are the one who is you're the customer of either the surveyor or the engineer or the phase one so that you own those reports because if you don't make the deal and they're your reports um, maybe the seller will pay you for those reports so that they'll have them um, extra, extra ground that's the the next slide I know um, I've seen a number of properties over the years where buyers have walked away from the um, the deal because there was extra ground and they said oh we don't want to have to mow all this extra ground it's going to be expensive and a lot more work and we don't want to have to mow the grass on these vacant sites so they just um, walked away from it and maybe that is the best thing to do but um, sometimes that extra ground you know could be sold off and maybe not for a lot of money but just to get rid of it maybe you could donate it to the city maybe they build a park next to um, your park or just try to um, think of what could you do to meet the sellers requirements or expectations of not wanting the hassle of having to do the subdivision um, seller financing Sellers tend to be, some sellers, most sellers, many sellers, however you want to say it, tend to be skeptical about seller financing. And if you're uh, working with a seller who's in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, they've either had a horror story or know somebody who's had a terrible situation where they sold a property on contract, the uh, the buyer milked the property, didn't put anything, any money into it, didn't keep it up, didn't make any payments, and then just um, you know gave the property back to, back to the seller. <clears throat> and so that's what they think of when when the topic of seller financing comes up. So making the uh, sellers will sometimes do seller financing if you're if you can really make the, a good case to them of what the benefit to them is I would do um, a presentation you know, do an amortization schedule show them how they're going to be able to defer the capital gains 
contacts, um, and let them know what your credit score is. I would be, um, you're probably going to have to guarantee it personally, and also those uh, seller financing might be a little bit easier if there's only one uh, owner, because if you have four or five or six partners and they're talking about a $3,000 a month payment that they have to divvy up five ways, then it's not as compelling, where if the seller is going to get a check for $3,000 a month at infinitum, um, you might um, you might have a better chance. And also, if you are paying a top dollar for the property or paying a premium for the property, then you're in a better position to say, uh, well, you know, I'll pay that price, but there's going to be seller financing. And um, I had a transaction not too long ago where they did a two-tier seller financing where there was one loan that was zero interest. And and this property was probably a five cap. Nobody, it was everybody in the country that was a park buyer knew about this deal, but it was it was too much money, you know, for most for most investors. But the um the the buyer was able to negotiate two seller financing loans, one at zero interest and the other um loan was at 1% interest for the first three years and then it went to 2% for the remaining term and no cash out. So just a fully amortizing loan. In addition, the park was mismanaged so the buyer was able to raise the rent, put in water meters, buy some homes and now it probably is about a 12 cap. and It's in a good market. So if you, um, you know, that, that might be a way that you could the seller could justify doing it that they're getting a a really good price for the property. Um, and then, um, oh, the next slide is about just being available. You know, once you make an offer, you know, I have a a pet theory about the brokerage business that once there's an offer made or an offer goes under contract, one or both of the parties uh, go on vacation or, you know, just are, become very hard to reach. And they go to places where there's, you know, fishing in Canada where there's no cell reception or just places where they're hard to reach. And when, uh, once I had a um, an offer that I was presenting, I had the sellers, all of the sellers in the room, and they had a couple of questions for the buyer that the buyer could have, they weren't hard questions, but I couldn't answer for the buyer. I had to speak to the buyer. And I couldn't reach the buyer because he was in a mountainous place on a vacation and couldn't be reached. So what happened, the, um, uh, the rest of the story is that they said, well, why don't you, you know, get a hold of your buyer and call us back when you get the information. In the meantime, you know, they had other people that had called about the property and they made the deal with another buyer for just a small, a little bit more money than uh, the buyer who couldn't be reached. So just um, uh, be try to be available when your offer is being presented. Um, negotiations. I know that there's been books and seminars about negotiate real estate negotiations, all kinds of negotiations, and what the what they've what they taught or what is taught in most of the books and seminars is you know tactics, you know putting a lot of options on the table, get reaching consensus, reaching agreement. I think um, you know uh, we do need to um, be able to give sellers options, and as a broker, I you know. That, that is my job to, you know, help these owners kind of rank what's most important to them when they're selling their property. And after doing all of that ranking, and it usually, usually comes out as the price. But but there's some new, I read a new study recently, and I think there's 
um, a lot to this, that really the negotiation is in the beginning when you are presenting yourself or your offer or your credentials to the broker, to the seller, or both, and you want that seller, that broker to bond with you or to, um, you want to stand out and be memorable to them. And you do that by um, letting them know about you. And I'll give you an example, um, and Frank, you might remember this, that um, this was actually a Frank and Dave deal that we had three offers on the table. And, um, you know, how they were just very, very close within spitting distance. And, this, you know, the seller was trying to figure out how they could, you know, decide which, which buyer to go with. So I went back to each of the buyers, the, uh, the three buyers, and said, well, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, where, where did you go to college? You know, where did you grow up? Um, you know, what was your first job? Just thing, I was just, you know, trying to give the seller a sense of who these people were, you know, with the idea that that might be helpful to them. Well, um, the the people who bought the property were Frank and Dave because they were prepared to talk about their, their background. And so were the other buyers, too. And it wasn't that the other buyers didn't have, you know, compelling backgrounds, but that did um, that did make a difference in that particular case. So you, you never know when the seller is like, oh, he went to the University of Arizona. My, you know, my brother went there. That's where one of my kids wants to go to school. And so things, things like that can be uh, important. And sometimes the seller, I've had this happen on occasion, where the seller will say to the broker, which buyer would you sign with if you were me? And so um, you want to be memorable to the broker as somebody who doesn't nitpick the deals to death, knows what they're doing, uh, isn't going to come back and try to retrade has you know that they've looked at the information and they're ready to uh, you're pretty you're ninety nine point nine 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 percent sure that if the seller signs that offer they're going to close now, um, so those are um, just some uh, some of the comments that I uh, thought of of working with brokers are there any questions Brandon, do you have any questions there? Yeah, Joanne, uh, th this person's question is on, uh, do you see that uh, interest rates are driving uh, prices up? Oh, yes, without a doubt. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to understand this question. One second. Uh, I guess this one's more for Frank. Frank, are you, you know, you know, with you buying 57 parks in the last 12 months, are you worried about the future of the business? I, I guess that could go for you and uh, I, I guess I'd have to say resoundingly no. Uh, we think the business right now is in its best position of all time simply because uh, we feel like the whole industry, the whole macro industry is about to transition from being kind of a goofy type of real estate in the opinion of many people to being mainstream. And when that finally happens, as it did in self-storage, it changes everything. If you look back, you know, if you want to see the future of mobile home parks, simply look at our close uh, brother or sister self-storage, which started in the 70s. Our industry started back in, well, or actually in the 60s. Our industry really started in the 50s. So even though they're a little younger, uh, they had much greater leadership in the form of uh, B. Wayne Hughes, who uh, founded public storage. Instead about making them, uh, you know, if you read articles about self-storage back in the 60s, they are openly proclaimed to be a goofy jackleg industry. And now today, of course, they're a uh, darling of the real estate industry. They're at the lowest, low, uh, they, they and mobile home parks compete each year for who has the lowest default rate. This past year it was self-storage. 
But self-storage went from basically considered to be something that wasn't really institutional grade to something that does conduit loans at will and is considered one of the most stable real estate enterprises. And we see ourselves as being in this, basically in the same boat that self-storage was back when they were still considered goofy. So, uh, you know, self-storage is three times more consolidated than mobile home parks. So consolidation is one leg of the stool. Another is basically creating self-storage did a much better job on public relations and building the image of the industry than we have by, by every stretch of the imagination. Uh, and then finally, you just have to post really, really good results every year. The art industry has, but yet it hasn't in as visible a way as self-storage thanks to public storage and the fact that they're much more consolidated and therefore their, their results are much more publicly known. So uh, in answer to the question, you know, we, we could not be more bullish on mobile home parks uh, at this moment because we feel like the industry is about to change dramatically and that kind of like a rising sea raises all boats, basically just the very fact that you are in the industry right when it goes from being goofy to being mainstream has huge dividends. And Joanne, I'll let you also piggyback on that. Yeah, I I agree, Frank, and I think for another reason too, the people that are buying all these parks today they're not going to hold these parks for 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, maybe some of them will. And maybe, you know, there. I'm sure there are some of the people buying today that they see their kids taking over the business. But they just, um, they just aren't because the prices are going up and they're more um, astute people. In other words, mobile home park owners, in my experience, think of – two investments in life. There's um, certificates of deposit at the bank and there's mobile home parks. And everything in between, they don't trust, they don't understand, therefore they don't want to get involved in it. But I think the people that are buying parks today, they're much more attuned to different investments. They're going to go through the normal cycle of being an investor and sell and put their money in something easy and safe. I think there's going to be tremendous opportunities to, to buy parks just for the simple reason that there will be more parks trading. And I think with um, a website like Mobile Home Park, story, which we basically have our own multiple listing service, you know, it'll just be readily available for everybody to, to see what's happening. Uh, what's the best way to break it to a seller that you're not going to be going through a deal because of the due diligence? The best way to ba break it to a seller that you're not going to be going ahead with a deal because I'm assuming that means that the due diligence failed or the, the financials, there were fewer homes or less revenue or the expenses were higher or something like that. Um, well, I think just to tell them straight up just yeah I wouldn't beat around the, the bush and uh, you know I think what you don't want you know, want to do is um, lose the opportunity to make that deal later on if the seller decides to um, you know get real with you know if there's fewer homes you know less income uh, more um, capital improvements needed that he'll fix those things or reduce the price and you want to be in good standing with him if possible and just say you're um, a straight shooter but you'd like to keep in touch with him in case anything ever changes because if you don't buy it because of uh, the you know there's the the due diligence doesn't work out probably nobody else is going to buy it either sure okay uh, have you seen any benefit from the buyer offering to pay the the full broker commission uh, to help kind of win a deal from a seller. Yeah, you know, it's that's that's a really good question because <clears throat> obviously, um, you know, it's, it goes back to the age-old question: Well, who's paying the commission? Well, if there's the 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 buyer really pays the commission, even if the the seller, you know, has the a, a fee agreement or a commission agreement with the with the broker because the buyer brings the deal and the you know whether or not the seller signs it is based on what the the commission is so i think it does um 
it does show good faith. It, it, it's meaningful to many sellers if the buyer is willing to um, pay the commission. Have you seen it? Uh, is it is it more difficult to sell parks with private utilities in terms of time and effort? It is just for the simple reason that there's um, so many people who the minute you say private utilities they're like nope uh, I've heard enough uh, not not for me uh, who determines the cap rate uh, for a property well the um, you know as a broker you try to keep as track of as many uh, sale comps as possible, and and also talk to appraisers and and um, you know investors like Frank and Dave and Perry and you guys uh, Brandon of you know just what what things are selling for, so you can you can recommend to the seller what the um, within a pretty tight range of what they can expect realistically, you know. As a broker, you try very hard to not tell the broker, the seller what they want to hear, but what the real, um, re the real value of the property is. So, what happens a lot of times is the sellers have a number in their head, and that number that the seller has in their head a lot of times comes from somebody in their market area that they heard of a park that sold that might have had much higher rent or the, the utilities were passed through to the to the tenants they don't they don't really understand how that equates to their property so they think that their property should sell for as much as the the other property where the rents were higher and the utilities are passed through but um, as a broker, you try not to take listings where the sellers aren't going to be reasonable and they're not going to pay any attention to what the market is. And Joanne, all right, how, well, okay, go how, ahead. How far will a typical seller go off their listing price? Like what percentage would you say? Well, Brandon, what I'm seeing is, you know, uh, how I think there's some buyers who are a lot of times is the products sell for above list price so um you know as a is that i think that works um depending on the seller's situation i don't I don't think there really is a rule of thumb because if a property sells below list price um there's probably something wrong with the property. Well, I'll jump in the joint. I mean, a lot of a lot of the stuff that we buy, you know, it's like good old negotiation. The seller always asks more than he expects. So, I mean, if I was to jump in there, I'd say traditionally, you know, you can expect that any negotiation, uh, you know, reduction maybe ten or twenty percent. But I think in some of the cases Joanne is describing, sometimes mom and pop has no idea what the value of the property is, and they threw it out in the market so far underneath its value that you, you can also have it go the other way. So a lot of that really depends on how sophisticated the seller is, I think would be the answer to that question. Sure, sure. And and, and on that, jo not Jan Joanne, since we're supposed to shut this thing down by seven, we have only a few moments left. I definitely wanted to thank you for being here. And also, can you, for those folks who are not seeing the computer screens, they're only here by phone, could you give people your contact information? Yeah, my um, direct line at my office is 319 Three seven eight six seven eight six, and I'll say that again: three one nine three seven eight six seven eight six. I have a website, and it's uh, Joanne J O A N N E M Stevens uh, Stevens with a V dot com. Great, Th thank you, thank you very much for being here, Joanne. And